Now, our scripture reading today is taken from the book of Revelation, uh, and John uh, is thought to have uh, written the book of Revelation, uh, the same John that wrote the three small letters of John, uh, and he wrote the uh, book to seven churches in Asia region where modern day Turkey is. Uh, so uh, the churches had uh, reached uh, the area of Turkey, the churches that he was writing to, the seven churches in Asia, which he said in the first part of the uh, first chapter of Revelation, uh, were uh, the audience. So they were away from uh, the church of, of Rome and away from the holy land specifically, uh, so the church had started to spread a little bit uh, into the rest of the region. And John's letter is uh, meant as uh, both an encouragement and uh, a few uh, words of peace to encourage the building of the churches in the era that they live in, which I will touch on a little bit later as well. So the passage is from Revelation chapter 1 verses 4 through 8. And it reads, Grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail, so it is to be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so ends the reading of God's word. Will you pray with me? God, living, eternal Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is the last week of the church year. Next week, we are excited to begin the season of Advent starting on Sunday as we wait for Jesus to be born as a baby. Today, however, summarizes the sovereignty of last things. The prophets prepared for a king. The king was born and gives the world an epiphany in the form of good news and is crucified and resurrected. The church then celebrates the resurrection and the beginning of the early church and proceeds into ordinary time as the church grows and prospers on the foundations of Jesus. And in the grand narrative, we are still in that phase today. At the culmination of this phase, Jesus will return and make his kingship known to all nations, and all nations will recognize him and be judged on that last day. We are in the phase where the churches are still building and celebrating the life and ministry and miracle of Jesus. And it is this day, uh, on the last day, that the church celebrates with Christ the King. Sunday is, uh, was Christ the King Sunday, and we continue to celebrate that as we lead into the next season of waiting in Advent. And I'd like to begin with a vision of Frederick Beekner, recorded in his book, Listening to Your Life. He wrote, one summer day, I lay upon the grass. I'd sinned no matter how, and in sin's wake, there came a kind of drowsy peace, so deep that I had not even the will to loathe myself. I had no mind to pray. I scarcely had a mind at all. 
the light breeze blew that tossed the trees, and as I lay there watching them, they formed a face of shadows and of leaves. It was a man's green, leafy face. He gazed at me from high above, and as the branches nodded in the air, he opened up his mouth as if to speak. No sound came from their lips, but by their shape, I knew that it was my name. When John wishes the peace that comes from the one who is and who was and who is to come, I believe that this is the kind of peace that he refers to. It catches us in a moment when we feel that we do not deserve it. We do not feel good enough to talk to God about it, yet it comes to us. We may feel removed from Revelation because of his descriptive visions about the future. Yet if Beekner called his experience a vision, and we are able to see these visions in the modern world, we may embrace what we see around us. I value the time that I spend in the woods, that I am able to find the peace that Beekner talks about. I am able to spend the entire summer at Camp Sequoia every year, taking in the smell of the pines, the warm breeze, and the waters of the clear pond. I am able to take moments when I am not busy appreciating what is found throughout that Boy Scout camp and finding God's gifts through it all. It is the same reason why I love hiking. It is good to get away for a while and spend time in nature where every green tree, burst of wind, and molecule of water is from God. Nature is beautiful. Jesus enjoyed going to deserted places to pray also in nature. He reminded us, that he reminded us about the majesty of God that is found all around us. Leon Morris wrote a commentary on Revelation as part of the Tyndale New Testament commentaries, painting the historical picture of the times in which the book was written. At the time of authorship, the Near East was under significant persecution. The year was about 90 AD, and anyone who claimed to be a Christian or opposed the emperor's rule was persecuted and likely put to death. The first three centuries of Christianity lived in an atmosphere of persecution and martyrdom. Christians believed in dying for their faith so that others could see that their faith was worth dying for. It may be shocking to realize that such Christian persecution still occurs in many countries overseas in today's world as well. <coughs> Revelation was written during a time of persecution, and Morris suggests that the composition of the book occurred during the reign of Domitian, who imposed emperor worship on his subjects. Revelation 13 suggests that a beast is given temporary reign during that time, and many affirm that this beast that John refers to is that emperor Domitian. He could not mention the emperor by name because then that book would be summoned and destroyed. So he finds other forms of referring to their present context. Now practices of emperor worship were uncommon before Domitian's reign, and this suggests that the book was written during that reign on either side of the year 90. The commentary reads, it was Domitian above all who demanded worship from his subjects. The emperors who had ruled before, like Nero, uh, had uh, persecution, plenty of it, but uh, they had less of this focus of actual worship. They demanded respect, but uh, it became a little bit different and more widespread to the churches in Asia as well, whereas during uh, Nero's reign, they were more localized. Uh, and. The commentary suggests that the author, John, was exiled to Patmos for proclaiming the word of God, which is supported by Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, so any uh, proclamation of God uh, against uh, the authority of the emperor was faced with exile, persecution, or death in the time that this book was written. Now, the HarperCollins Study Bible suggests 
uh, that the reign of Domitian is more likely the context of the composition of the book because, as it said, persecution was occurring outside of Rome. During Nero's reign, persecution was localized, and by 90, persecution had spread to the regions of Asia Minor that were mentioned as a target audience. John was right into the seven churches who are in Asia, which implies that persecution was farther reaching than just in Rome. Now, we think that the times that we live in today are pretty bad, and they are. Violence occurs everywhere we look, and we cannot watch the news without hearing that another tragedy of crime had occurred somewhere. It seems, though, that when you look at the environment of the first centuries of the Christian church, there was violence occurring in every direction as well then. People were mistreated and killed simply because their beliefs were not the same as the Roman emperors. It was a tough time to be a Christian. It has never been completely easy to be a Christian. It was never meant to be. Frederick Beekner remembered that he had been told about two kinds of Christians in the world. He wrote that there are gloomy Christians and there are joyful Christians. I assume that we all have tasted both sides of this at one point or another. We ask questions like Habakkuk, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. Habakkuk 1, verse 2 through 4. Now we are lost in asking God these questions each and every day. I have struggled time and again with these very questions myself. Why, God, are innocent people allowed to die? And why do humans believe that it is okay to harm each other instead of building each other up? Why do people assume malicious intent when I truly strive to do good for another or for the world? There is a time to be gloomy, but it is not worth living our entire lives in this way when we can rejoice and make what difference we can. We can also relate to Habakkuk when he praises God anyway. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fruit and the, and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He, meet, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. God makes our mission possible. When I focus on what I am thankful for, I can thank God for so many things. I am thankful that I have a good education. I am thankful that I have friends who support me. I am thankful that I am able to pass on what has been given to me because that is what we should do with God's love once we have experienced it. Many people have given me books and commentaries, uh, churches that I have been in the past support my journey, and that has been so meaningful to me. And I know that I can later repay that when it is time for uh, another pastor that I noticed uh, who needs some support. And I am thankful for another strength from another source, when I have used and exhausted my entire supply of effort. Source is, of course, God, who we can appeal to. It is not easy being a Christian, but it is definitely worthwhile. We must first recognize that it is worth rejoicing in the midst of turmoil. Paul rejoiced through his letters written from prison. In the midst of sin, when we do not feel as if we are worthy to pray to God, God finds us. In the midst of chaos, when we are overwhelmed, we can find the peace of nature. In the midst of evil, when we do not feel the world is worthy, God waits for the world to call. 
God waits for us to do something as we can do when we so love. If we are not the body, why are Christ's feet not moving? That is a song lyric that has moved me toward the possibility of change. The second aspect that we must, that we must recognize is that peace is given by God. It does not come from our own strength. Revelation 1 verse 4 affirms that the source of peace is the one who is and who was and who is to come. It is from the seven spirits who are before his throne, who in 5-6 were sent out into all the earth and who are referred to as angels of God in chapter 8 verse 2. Angels of God scatter peace throughout the earth. It is this peace that gives us strength to endure, a place to rest, and a reason to rejoice. One of my classes this semester has been in spiritual formation. To experience peace in a communal relationship with God, we practice silence, focusing toward God for minutes at a time. Eventually, we were able to engage in prayer in God's presence and pauses in the moments of prayer left room for God's response. The class has taught powerful ways to experience peace in conversation with God. It is not just one way, it is a two-way relationship. And we gain that peace from God when we give God our time. The first half of our selection from Revelation includes what the ministry of Jesus has proven in the past. It notes how Jesus freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom. The kingdom has survived for centuries and millennia of opposition because a determined few have never been willing to give up on the return of a king. Jesus made it possible to be saved from sins by being a witness to God's glory while on earth and rising from the dead. Jesus formed the kingdom of believers, and the believers continue serving God to this day. Jesus reminded the people that God's works of miracles did not just exist in the past, on the journey of the Exodus or on the return from Babylon. They exist in present wonders and joys as well. Jesus became the firstborn of the dead as a miracle in his own time, and it also as a promise that he is not the only one to rise from the dead. He is merely the firstborn of the dead with many others to follow. The peace of knowing this is given by God. Death in turmoil is not the end. We are participants, and we will be participants. Jesus reminded us of the miracles that we are able to partake in day in and day out and notice uh, all around us in nature and wherever we may find God's miracles in our lives. Jesus reminded us of these miracles that they are present in his day and not only in his day, but in our day as well. Uh, Jesus reminded us about the majesty found all around us. Now the people who were under Domitian's rule and called themselves Christians suffered, yet they suffered for a cause. They knew that it is worth rejoicing in the midst of turmoil as Paul rejoiced in chains. They knew that they could find peace from God even in Nazareth, which Nativity Story, a movie, shows as one of the poorest regions without mercy from tax collectors of King Herod. Third, they believed in their cause because they knew with confidence that Jesus would return. When John wrote Revelation, he did so with the hope of encouraging discouraged Christians that Jesus would return and the entire world would rejoice in his name. He wrote to a people of a different context, but I'm sure that both the churches in Asia in 90 AD and the churches in North America in 2018 are facing similar discouragement. 
We can choose to be gloomy Christians in the face of the world, or we can know that we do not belong in the world, and that our mission is to be guided by the light of what is to come. Our third challenge is believing that Jesus will keep his promise to return. Peter spoke to the, to the delay in his second letter to the faithful. When Jesus left, everyone thought that he would return in only a few years. When the time stretched longer and longer, witnesses wrote down what they had seen so that their faith could be passed on long after they were removed from the scene. We can be encouraged by the same words that encouraged the first generations of believers. He wrote, Peter wrote, do not, do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. From 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-10, through 10, God delays so that more might be saved. This is a message that can be applied to us as well. In the time that is left, it is our mission to help as many people as we can to come to Christ. We must do it in the right way, by being loving and cherishing kindness in the face of the evil that discourages. Frederick Beekner tells us that the king does come. I would like to read what he has to say about the king being on his way. He writes, When Jesus of Nazareth rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and his followers cried out, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The Pharisees went to Jesus and told him to put an end to their blasphemies. And Jesus said to them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. This church, the church on the other side of town, the church on the other side of the world, all churches everywhere. The day will come when they will lie in ruins every last one of them. He continues, the day will come when all the voices that were ever raised in them, including our own, will be permanently stilled. But when that day comes, I believe that the tumbled stones will cry aloud of the great deep hope that down through the centuries has been the one reason for having churches at all. And that is the one reason we have for coming to this now the hope that into the world the king does come, and in the name of the Lord, and is always coming, blessed be he, and will come with fire and glory at the end of time. In the meantime, King Jesus, he ends in prayer, we offer all, all churches to you as you offer them to us. Make thyself known in them, Make our stone hearts cry aloud thy kingship. Make us holy and human at last, that we may do the work of thy love. This is found in the book, Listening to Your Life. But we do not know when that day that he speaks of, and that Revelation speaks of, will come. But we can have confidence that it is coming. The second part of the text looks toward the future coming of Jesus, which is an important promise of his ministry. Revelation 1 verse 7 affirms that Jesus is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him. The present tense leading into the future tense implies that Jesus is already coming, but is not yet a realization. We need to let Jesus come into our hearts before every eye will see him, through the overflowing of each of our hearts. On the day when Jesus does come, no one will be able to look away. All will see God as sovereign. God is the Alpha and the Omega, 
the most powerful of anything and powerful over everything in the world. Jesus is the true king over our lives. 1 Samuel 8, 5-7 is the story of God being rejected as king because the people want a king like the other nations. But let us remind each other that we do not need to be like the others and that our leaders are our guides and representatives on the journey, not our kings. We do not listen to the justice in this world that would tell us because we have sinned, our God will rain fire down upon us. We listen to the God who still loved the people even when they called a new king. We love the friend who never gave up on us. God was our king, God still is our king, and God will continue to be our king. We must center our lives and devotion on and for God and not on other things. We must learn to rejoice in the midst of turmoil, calling on God's direction. We may lament when needed. We must seek peace of God by praying and, and welcoming the presence of God into the space that is our lives. We must seek the peace of God by praying and welcoming the presence of God that is based into our lives that is worth repeating. And the presence of God will help us believe that Jesus is still our king, not a king of long ago, and that our king is returning to redeem the lost world. There will come a day when the entire world will see this power and rejoice in the king coming with the clouds of heaven and robed in majesty, according to Daniel 7.13 and Psalm 93.1. Rejoice, because we can call on our king whenever we wish. Rejoice, because Jesus bore witness to the glory of God for us to see and bear witness to ourselves. Rejoice, because even if we were silent, the rocks would cry out in praise. The world is a broken place, but the people of the church can have hope that God remains sovereign and that Jesus is still coming according to his promise. The rule of earthly leaders and temptations is only temporary. God is the true king. We can continue to live in hope as John did and continue to give glory and honor to God and Jesus, our King. The contrast of our hopeful, loving lives and the broken world will amaze others and say to others, look, there is God in the trees. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us have a moment of prayer. Living God, we thank